If you're new, I'll tell you right out of the gate here that um, I'm the pastor with a past. Like, I've been through some things before I became called into full-time ministry. For example, uh, many of you maybe don't even know this, but I actually, I spent an evening in jail. And uh, some of you are like, yeah, I figured, but, you know, whatever. So, but I actually did. I was 22 years old. I was driving with two friends of mine, and uh, I, I turned the wrong way down a one-way. And the ironic thing is the police officer didn't have to, like, um, put his lights on because he was literally standing, like, in the road. So I was driving right by him. He knocks on my window and says, sir. I'm like, yes, yeah, sir. And he says, can you pull over? Uh, you're going the wrong way. And I wanted to say no and take off, but, you know, that would have caused trouble. So I did pull over, and you might think, wait a minute, you got arrested just for, just for going the wrong way? Well, there's actually more to the story, and you don't need to know all the story. But anyway, so, yeah, I was, so I'm in jail, and I'm thinking that uh, my friends are going to bail me out. That's that how these things are supposed to go. An hour passes, no one's coming to get me. Two hours pass, and I realize no one's coming to get me. I, I, my, my friends, we'll call them Frick and Frack, are probably at another club as I sit there right there. And you might be thinking, well, you could maybe make that phone call or call, like, your parents to come rescue you, like, when you need to be bailed out. We, don't we do that? We call our mom or our dad, and they rescue us from whatever. But I, I would say to you, you don't know my, not, my mom. I mean, I could call her to come get me, but she, and she would come, but it wouldn't be to bail me out. It'd be like to say, you know, give him another night just to kind of sit on it. You know, it's, she would not be bailing me out of anything. Um, but uh, that night, that's bringing back some memories. But uh, <laughs> here, I'll, I wasn't going to share this, but this is pre-World uh, pre Wide Web. That's, this dates me a little bit. So there wasn't the internet yet. So when, when there's arrests that happen, they would put them in the paper. So, so you try to keep it quiet. Now, now the paper, a newspaper kids is the, you take the anyway. So it's it's the internet on a piece of paper, all right. And uh, so they put it in there. And I'll never forget the day that my name was there. My sister saw it, called my mom, of course, told my mom. So I couldn't even keep it from my mother. Made for an awkward gathering when I got back to see my mom at Thanksgiving. Monty, what are you thankful for? Maybe your freedom? Hmm? And I'm like, okay, well, yes, my freedom. So it was just terrible. But uh, I, I bring that up because here's the thing. Many times we cry out to God or a mom or a dad or a friend to bail us out, to rescue us. We, we go to them, we pray to him after the fact, after we're in jail, after we've dug a hole that we can't get out of. But, but I came to tell you something today that I believe there's power when we pray first. Say pray first. Yeah. So I recently read a book by Pastor Chris Hodges, and that the title is Pray First. And it was convicting because I realized in reading the book how many times I don't pray first, and I pray reactively and not proactively. And it's, it's, it's so powerful. And he wrote this line in the book, and I'll, I'll, I'll leave you with this. How different would your life look and my life look if we were to pray first before everything we do, how different would your life look? See, I believe this about you. Even if you don't pray much, you, you want to. You know that you should, but many people don't know what to do or how to do it. And I would contend don't overcomplicate it. Prayer is simply talking with and listening to God. That, that's all it is. It's talking with and listening to God. And we sometimes will make it more difficult than that, but it doesn't have to be. Prayer connects you with God. Say connect. It connects you with God and helps you live out your purpose that he has for you. And sometimes I'll hear people say, well, prayer is the only thing we can do. But I would contend, and I think God wants you to know today, that prayer is not just the only thing you can do. It is the best thing you can do. And it brings me to one of the main points already early in the message. Prayer is the difference between the best you can do and the best God can do. I'm going to say that again. Prayer is the difference between the best you can do and the best God can do. I want to read to you a story. It's a true story out of the Bible. It's in the book of Acts. And this, is the, this whole book of Acts is Jesus has died on a cross. He's risen from the dead. He's given some instructions. And then he's gone up to be with the Father in a physical sense. And now his church begins. So this is the new believers, and I'm going to give you the last words that Jesus ever speaks to his disciples before he rises up and leaves them 
in that way. Acts 1.8, listen to this. This is, this is Jesus speaking. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you'll be my witnesses telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, through Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And then Jesus goes away. In the scene, they're sitting there looking up in the sky, and this is what they do next. Acts 1.12. Then the apostles returned to Jerusalem from that mountain, about a half mile, so they got their steps in. That's great. So when they arrived, they went upstairs into a room of the house where they were staying. And then the Bible names the disciples that were there, and you know some of these names, Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, Simon the Zealot, Judas, the son of James, and uh, the only one missing is the, the other Judas, right? He was hanging out somewhere else at this point, but uh, yeah, some of you might get that. But anyway, so uh, verse 14, listen to this. This is the first thing they do when they get back to that upper room. They all met together, and they were constantly united in what? Mm -hmm. Along with Mary, the mother of Jesus, several other women, and the brothers of Jesus. They're all there praying. Ironically enough, the brothers of Jesus, two months earlier, didn't even believe that Jesus was anything special. And now they're sitting there praying with their mom in his name. I bet Mary's like, I, I tried to tell you. I wasn't just playing favorites. He is special. There's a reason that Jesus was in charge when your dad and I were out at the camel races or wherever. I don't know what they did for fun. But, I mean, Jesus, the son of God, they're praying to Jesus and they're praying first. It's the first thing they do. I'm telling you, no matter what you're doing throughout the day, when you pray first and you give glory to God, he honors it. You need to know this. You need to, he wants us to know this. And let me ask a question. How did the apostles, how did Mother Mary, how did Jesus' brothers, how did they even know to do that? How did they know when they got in that room, we need to pray right away? We need to pray first. Nothing's happened yet, but we need to pray now. I'll tell you how they knew. They watched Jesus. Jesus modeled it. You know, you know Jesus prayed in the Gospels like more than three dozen times. Jesus goes to pray. But here's what I never noticed before. How many times he prays first? How many times he prays before he's going to do something, before something's going to happen, before the miracle? I'll, I'll give you a few examples just so you can see it yourself. It's amazing how it just starts to come alive. He prayed before the day began. Mark 135. Before daybreak the next morning, Jesus got up and went out in an isolated place to pray. Before tap dancing across the Sea of Galilee to rescue his friends, Mark, or Matthew 14, 23, after sending them home, he went up to the hills to pray by himself. Night fell while he was there alone. Meanwhile, the disciples are in all kinds of trouble in a faraway land, for the strong wind had risen, and they were fighting heavy ways. And Jesus goes to rescue them. Jesus prays first before choosing his 12 disciples. Luke 6, 12, one day soon afterward, Jesus went up on a mountain to pray. And he prayed to God all night. At daybreak, he called together all the disciples, and he chose 12 of them to be the apostles. Jesus prayed before asking the disciples the most important question that could ever be asked. Luke 9, 18. One day, Jesus left the crowds to pray alone. Only his disciples were with him, and he asked them, who do people say that I am? Who do people say that I am? He prays, and then he asks this question. Jesus prayed before he healed many people. I'll give you one example. Mark 7, 34. Looking up to heaven, Jesus prays to the Father and says, Ephatha, which means be opened. Instantly, the man could hear perfectly. A man who was mute could hear, and he could, and he, and he could speak. Jesus prays, and then he heals. The most powerful force on earth is God's power in answer to your prayer, especially when you pray first. That's what he wants you to know. That's what he wants me to know. And if we believe that, church, we'll do it. If we believe that, we, shouldn't we make it an absolute priority to pray before anything that we do? Not after we act, but before? I wrote this down. It's a pretty simple statement. And this is a true statement. You won't even, you, you'll agree, I promise you. We do first, say first, 
what matters most. Don't we? I mean, honestly, we do. We're going to do first what matters most. This is why I'm trying to talk my wife, Jody into, like, when we go out and eat, we eat dessert first. Why aren't we doing that? We should be eating dessert first. It's a travesty when the wait, server says, hey, do you have room for dessert? And you say, no? I mean, this is not, that, that shouldn't be a thing. Bring me the double chocolate lava cake now. And if I have room for an appetizer, I'll let you know, right? I'm going to eat dessert first. That's a new mantra for the church right there. But this isn't just our church mantra. It was Jesus's. Jesus in Matthew 6, Seek the kingdom of God first above all else and live righteously. And he'll give you everything you need. Did you hear that? Seek first the kingdom Live righteously, and he'll take care of everything. He's got you, but you got to go to him first. And by the way, isn't that why we pray? Honestly, isn't that why we say almost any prayer that we say is we're asking God, God, provide. God, we need you to show up. God, would you provide the healing? God, would you provide direction? God, would you provide wisdom? God, would you provide provision? God, would you provide a way? I mean, every, almost every prayer that you pray you're asking God to meet your needs, and so am I. And God just tells us how that can happen. Seek first the kingdom of God. By the way, I wrote this down. Trusting, when we, when we trust God first, something supernatural happens. When we give him the first of anything, the first of your time, the first of your attention, the first of your energy, the first of your thoughts for the day, when we give him anything first, God honors that. It's tithing. People think tithing is all about money. It ain't about money. Money is what God chooses to use because it's got our heart a lot of times. But tithing is trusting. Tithing is trusting God first. Tithing is like returning 10% back to God. If you've never heard that word before, I remember I never had until I went to a church um, 16 years ago. But, but it's about trust. It's about trusting God first. Like, God, I'm going to trust you with my first and my best. And I'm going to trust that you bless the rest. See, God, giving first honors God. Praying first honors God. God wants us to pray before anything and everything we do. He wants us to, to thank him first, to ask him first, to trust him first, to seek him first, to hear from him first, and trust that he will provide, and he always does, every time, every time, God provides. He's so good. We trust him first. We make it a priority. But here's the thing, and this is where it's going to get practical for you and I. Because I don't want to just sit up here and say, yep, pray first, trust him first. All right, have a good week. We have to do this together. So, and to do it together and to really make this stick, we have to be intentional and we need a plan. This is why I'm so excited to tell you a goal that we put together as a church for the rest of the year, really almost to the end of the year, and that is this. As a church, collectively, we want to pray 6,500 hours of prayer minimum to God. Because we believe in the power of prayer and praying first. And we're asking God to do big, miraculous things. So 6,500 hours of prayer. And so how are we going to do that? That's a great question, even though you're, I'm sure you're thinking it. So here's what we're going to do. If you're in a group, like you're in a purpose group or a life group, You'll, you'll keep track every week, and your leader will tally it up and send us numbers at the end of every month. If you're not in a group, like, boy, get in a life group if you're not in one. They're so powerful, and they're so necessary. But maybe for some reason right now you're unable. This is what I want you to do so we can, you can keep track of your prayers as well and, and write down your, the time that you're logging with God. You can use that same number I mentioned earlier, 402 628 7166. Yeah, there it is. Uh, man, take a picture, save that in your phone. And at the end of this month, the next month, the next month, you can just, you'll text the word prayer. It will send back a message. And in that message, you'll put your name and the number of hours or a prayer request, right? Both is good. And that's how you'll tell us if you're not in a group right now. So, but we want to collectively be praying powerfully to God. And that's how we want to just log the time. And I'll give you some prompts. This will help you. I'm asking that you would pray a minimum of three times a day. And you might be thinking, I don't pray at all. Well, we're gonna, I'm going to try to make it easy for you. The message is called pray first. So when you wake up in the morning, the first thing I want you to do 
Just go to God. God, thank you for the fact that I'm breathing. Thank you that I'm here today. Thank you that you, 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 you've, you've got air in my lungs and my heart, blood in my heart. And God, that you have a beautiful day planned for me. Just pray to him right away. And then I'm going to ask you to set your, your, your clock or your, your clock, your phone for 633. I would say PM, um, but you do either way. But that Matthew 633, seek first the kingdom of God. And at 633, when that alarm goes off, you pray. And then, of course, right before bed, you pray. Now, some of you already have 923 saved in your phone from a previous message from years ago. Leave it in. Daniel 923, powerful verse. Read it when you get home today, but don't take that out. If you've got that in there, leave that in there as well. But these are the three prompts minimum that we can pray together. And I'll even help you on how to pray. Remember what we said earlier? You're just talking to God. It's just a conversation like you're talking to anybody. You can get real with him. You can get upset with him if you're upset. You can, you can cry to him if you're, if, you're, if you're sad. He can take it. But there's, a, there's a, a prompt, and we put this on the website as well. It's an acronym, and it's called ACTS, just like the book we're reading out of today, the book of ACTS. And, and it stands for, uh, the A is adoration. That's just giving glory to God. God, I praise you today. You're on the throne, and I'm not. That's a good day. The C is confession. You confess anything that you need to confess to God. The T, thanksgiving, that you would thank God for all that he's given you. And finally, the S, supplication, that's when you go to God and you, you, with, your, with your asks, with your, you pray for yourself, you pray for others. So, and that, this is all on the website under the prayer tab, and it says the prayer plan, and you'll find all this there. But that's a formula that you can use when you pray that will help you. But log your time. This is going to be powerful for our church. Pray for your family, your friends. I mean, we can, we'll probably put a list on the website as well to give you ideas of all the things that you can be praying for and thanking God for. But we just want to do everything we can to equip you, me, us as the church to pray together. Nothing happens without it. And, and, I, and I've, I'm, I've learned so much recently from what God is showing me in the Word. And uh, by the way, we'll have something here next week that we're going to hand out to you as well. And that'll be another reminder for you to pray first. I can't wait. But it, it is time that we, that we stop praying after the fact and that we pray before we act. Seek first the kingdom of God. Live righteously. And God will provide. See, I always, I, I've switched that around. I'm like, God, I want you to provide. And, and you do this for me, God. You do that for me. And then I, I may or may not live righteously, and I, I may or may not seek you. If I do, it probably won't be first. But, but I've gotten it backwards so much, and I wonder why God's not showing up in so many areas of my life, and I keep going down. And why is this happening, God? It's because you had it out of order. There's a principle to this. Say first. God must be first. In our prayers, God must be first. He wants to be first. It's for your benefit. It's for my benefit. If you don't know, Meadows, we got our name from Psalm 23, right? The Lord is my shepherd. I have all that I need. He lets me rest in green meadows. I love the first verse, even before you get to the meadows part. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. Think about that for a second. That's what we're talking about. God, you are my shepherd. I trust who you are. I praise you. I give you glory. I don't know what I'm doing today, but but you do. Guide me. And God, if I do that, if I seek you first, I'll lack nothing. You'll provide everything I need. And the great news is God's plans are better than your plans, so he'll give you more than even what you ask. More blessing. I'm telling you, this this is all over the word of God. But I love the I lack nothing. So in the Old Testament, you you maybe heard the word Jehovah. Jehovah. That's a Hebrew uh, name or word for God. So, and there's many attributes for God, many names that are attached to Jehovah that describe who he is. And we can't get into all that today, but I'll give you one. Jehovah Jireh. It means God will provide. It means I, it means I lack nothing with God. The Lord will take care of me. The Lord will provide. I will not lack. If you can cling to that, I'll tell you the, the number, well, there's two things I think that we cling to more than anything else. And uh, people, 
right? We cling to other people. We put our hope in others. You know, you, people will let you down. You know that. Don't point. Don't give anybody this eye die right now, but people will let you down. God won't. But we put our hope in people way too much. We also put our hope in finances way too much. And I'm speaking to me just like I'm speaking to you. Trust me. I don't judge anybody for that because I did that all my life. But financial security, this is, I love what the book said, and I'll quote the book on this, um, in Pastor Chris Hodges. This is what he said. Financial security is an illusion. If you ask most people what it would take for them to be, feel financially secure, secure, they would usually say, more than I have right now. That's generally the answer. Financial security is a ploy from the enemy to entice you to trust yourself and not God. God, he's just pegging it. When you're relying on money, enough is never enough. And that's, that's what we get into sometimes. Again, that's why giving first is so powerful. At least it has been for me and my family. Because I'll quickly cling to things that I think are going to make me secure and make me happy. And start believing the lies of what the world pits against us. By the way, think about this. Why in the world would we put our hope in provision when we can put our hope in the provider. Like the word of God says, in all things, like God will supply all your needs according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. God owns it all. God has it all. And when you trust the provider and not the provision, and you go to him first, it is a game changer. When we pray first, God will provide. So back to Jesus. Jesus prayed first a lot. We went through a lot of examples today. You know he prayed first before he got arrested, before he got beaten, before he got betrayed? It's in a garden called Gethsemane. This is what it says, Luke twenty two forty one. 41. Jesus walked away from the, the three, Peter, James, and John, about a stone's throw. He knelt down in a garden and he prayed. I can't imagine the scene. So Jesus knows what's coming. He knows a beating is coming. He knows a crucifixion is coming. He knows a bloody cross is coming. And he kneels down and he prays, God, your will be done. And the son knew the father's will. You. You were his will. That you would be saved from yourself, saved from your sin, saved from your mess, saved from your bad decisions. From your, from your mistakes, from all the things that you do that rebel against God, and I do that rebel against God. So Jesus prays first in the garden. And sure enough, just like he knew what happened, he gets up from praying, he goes back out with the th his closest, and then he's betrayed by one of his best friends. And he gets arrested. And he gets beaten almost to death. But that wouldn't fulfill prophecy that said he must die on a cross with no bones being broken, and that's exactly what happened. But this is what gets me. Jesus, he gets nailed to a cross. And this is happening because he loves you. God loves you, pursues you. This is salvation, by the way. You're not saved by being good. If somebody asks, how do I get to heaven? Don't ever answer, well, good people go to heaven, bad people go to hell. It's not biblically accurate. Saved people go to heaven by the grace of God who call in the name of Jesus Christ. Believe in him as Savior and Lord. And surrender their life to him. Those people go to heaven. And as those people continually seek Jesus, well, they naturally get gooder and gooder. But perfection isn't the key. Jesus is the key, and he's perfect. So Jesus goes to the cross, and this is what gets me. He's hanging on the cross. You know what he, you know what the first thing he does on the cross? He prays first. That's not even the kicker. What he prays first? Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. He prays for you first. He prays for, for us first. For the accusers, for the, for the ones that punched him and ripped out his beard. And plunged nails in his hands and his feet. He says, forgive them, God. Forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. You would pray for us first? For us 
This is the good news of Jesus. This is why we can give them our first and our best of everything. Father, forgive them. And he, he prays some more prayers, and then he would give up his spirit, and he would die. It's so crazy. Think about that for a second. When you and I were at our worst, God gave his best. When you and I were in our mess, in our dysfunction, in the hole that we dug, and some of you, you're there right now, I mean, God's not mad at you. He's not, he's not happy with the choices, but he's certainly happy that his son made a choice to save you from it. He loves you. And he brought you here today. And he's drawing you in by the power of the Holy Spirit. And he wants to reveal himself to you in new and fresh ways. Do not let the gospel fall on void ears or deaf ears. We are dead in our sin. We are dead in our mess. And the only way out is a bloody cross and an empty tomb. Oh, that's right. The greatest miracle in history. Jesus didn't stay dead. After three days, he brought himself back to life to save me, to save you, to save your friends, your family, your teachers, anybody that you know. We thank you, God. He provided his son. May we surrender to that. Here's, here's the, what we want you to do. We want you to pray and log your hours and give them to your leader or text them to us at the end of every month. We want to pray first. And for prompts, pray in the morning right away. That's first. Pray at 633 and pray before you go to bed. If you don't know how to pray or the formula, you can use Acts. Adoration, God, you're good. I praise you. Confession, God, I am. Look what I've done. Look what I'm doing. And the thing is, he loves when you confess with a repentant heart. Do you, you see how much he wants to forgive you? Look at Christ on the cross. Thank him for the forgiveness. Thank him for the bloody cross and the empty tomb. And then go to him and ask him and tell him what you need. He wants to hear from you. He's in love with you. That's it. Oh, and then surrender your life to Christ. If you've never done that, that needs to happen. That's what saves you. Nothing else can and nothing else will. And then, of course, baptism is that next step. And you know who you are. I want to close making a declaration. And as I close, it's okay to get excited. It's okay to get loud. But we want to declare Jehovah Jireh today. We want to declare that God is our provider today in all our situations, in all, all our mess, in all our dysfunction. We want to de declare today, God, well, you are enough. See, in, in, in your depression... In your anxiety, in your messed up mind where you go from the world to God, the world to God, we're declaring, God, we don't want that. You are enough. See, in, in your lack of faith, when, when you come to church on Sunday, but then you don't even hardly know God, you think on Monday, God, we declare, you are enough. When you're facing something and you have fear, you declare, God, you are enough. In your family, God is enough. In your children, God is enough. With your spouse, God is enough. In your singleness, I can't hear you. In your singleness, God is enough. In all the things that you're doing, God, you are enough to save and set somebody free. Let's praise him. Hey, I want to thank you so much for tuning in today. But don't stop there. Like or subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a single video, update, or message. And not only that, share this message with a friend or somebody that you know. So many people out there need hope and encouragement, and you have the ability to bring that to them. Finally, if you're in the Omaha area, we would love to have you join us. We would love to meet you. God bless you.